Okay, so now we're going to talk about the first three Buddhist councils. This is quite a bit of historical significance. It's a bit dry, but it's good to know the background, some of the happenings after the Buddha's passing away, to see how Buddhism developed, to see the evolution of Buddhism and, and how it led to some of the traditions today. La. So there are three councils. The first council was held at 544 BC, second council 444 BC, third council 326 BC. The first council took place three months after the Buddha's passing away. So that was around 544 BC. This was held at Rajagaha, as it was known at that time. Right now it's called Rajgir in India. It was held in the Satapani cave, sponsored by King Aja Tasatu, who was the son of uh, King Bimbisara, both of these who were strong supporters of the Buddha. So this council was presided over by Venerable Mahakasapa with 500 monks. This is a place here, the Rajagaha. So the background to this council is that after the Buddha's passing away, there was this monk called Subhadha. He was an old monk who joined the Sangha quite late in life. That means he joined when he was quite old. So he resented the strict rules of the Sangha, all the Vinaya rules. After the Buddha passed away, he told everybody, you know, why are you all so sad? You all should be rejoicing, you all should be happy, because now we don't have to follow all these uh, rules anymore. You can do whatever we want, the teachings we can interpret in any way we want. So the Master has passed away, we should rejoice, because now we, we have our freedom. So this Venerable Mahakasapa overheard this Venerable Subhada talking like that. So he was quite worried that if everybody were to become like Subhada, they don't follow the rules, they interpret the Dharma and Vinaya in whatever way they want, then Buddhism would disappear very quickly because it become very corrupt very quickly. So Mahakasapa convened the first council to prevent the Dharma and Vinaya from being corrupted and to protect and preserve the teachings of the Buddha. So some of the points about the first council is that the Buddha, before he passed away, told Venerable Ananda that some of the minor rules could be changed. Ananda did not ask which ones. But in any case, the Sangha decided that no changes were to be made and all the monastic rules were preserved as originally laid down. That means they did not change any rules. So the rest of the 500 monks of the council agreed on this and they formalized the Vinaya and Dharma. As you know, the Vinaya is the code for the monks. The Dharma are the suttas, the teachings of the Buddha. So this is the code of discipline for the monks, and these are the teachings of the Buddha. So during the first council, they were compiled into these two, the Vinaya Pitaka and the Sutta Pitaka. So they were memorized and they were handed down by oral tradition. That means the monks chanted, 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 and then handed down orally. So this process took seven months. This is a picture of the Sati Pani cave. La. You can actually go and visit in the Rajagaha Rajgir now. So at that time, there were no written records of the teachings and the monks had to memorize them and then teach the next generation of monks in the same way. So one of the reasons they did that is because if they wrote it down at that early stage, these writings may have been lost, they may have been altered, they may have been destroyed. So if monks chanted them in unison, in groups, like 500 or, or whatever number at the same time, then there's less chances of the teachings becoming corrupted. Because if one monk made a mistake, then the other monks can correct that monk. And if one monk wants to make a change, the other monks will notice that, and then they would not allow changes to be made. So that's why they did this in the early stage, to have this oral chanting by large numbers of monks, to ensure that the teachings were correctly passed down. So they were recited by groups of monks, like I said, they would cross-check with each other, the monks, when they chanted, to ensure that no omissions, no additions, no alterations were made. Further to that, around 83 BC, there was this fourth council in the Theravada tradition. This fourth council was held in the town of Matale at Aluvihara Temple in Sri Lanka. So at that time, they were chanted orally. So it's only in this fourth council that the teachings were put down in writing on ola leaves, so any this is a picture of the uh, bamboo grove in uh, Rajkia. Like you can visit it. It's really quite nice. And this is the vulture's peak also in Rajkia. You can climb up and then you can meditate here. It's really quite peaceful. So it's, it's a bit of a climb, but it's really quite worth it. So the vulture's peak is significant for Mahayana because in many of the Mahayana suttas, the Buddha gave his teachings at the vulture's peak to all the deities and bodhisattvas and the disciples. So this is a view from vulture's peak. 
from here you can see almost the whole landscape. So from quite far down, it takes about um, I think an hour or so just to walk up to the peak. This at the peak, this uh, peace uh, pagoda uh, built by the Japanese. They build these pagodas all over the place. So it's next to the vultures peak. So how you go up to this place is Indian cable car. I think this cable car was donated by the Japanese. So from here you can go up, climb up to the Peace Pagoda, the Japanese Peace Pagoda. And then from here you can walk across. It's quite a rocky road to the Vulture's Peak. So the purpose of the First Council was to recite and reaffirm the Dharma and Vinaya to protect and preserve the teachings of the Buddha. Okay, you must note this. Huh? Dharma and Vinaya. No Abhidharma. So contrary to what some people tell you that Abhidharma was taught by the Buddha. It's not. Abhidharma was a later development, developing about a couple of hundred years after the Buddha's passing away. So this is one of the evidence to show that Abhidharma is not taught by the Buddha because the monks did not recite the Abhidharma at the first council. So only the Dharma and Vinaya. So this is one of the proofs that the Abhidharma was not the Buddha's teaching. It's a later development. But not to say that we should not learn the Abhidharma because there are many useful things we can learn in the Abhidharma which gives us an added dimension to the suttas and to the Dharma. So as Theravada Buddhists, not to say we should not learn the Abhidharma, we should, but we must re realize and recognize that it's not the Buddha's teachings but derived from the Buddha's teachings. Okay, the second council took place a hundred years after the Buddha's passing, held at the town of Vesali. Patron King Kalasoka presided over by Venerable Revata with 700 monks. Okay, what happened during this period of time was that the monks were all over the place. So while visiting the northeast of India, around Vesali, Venerable Yasa saw that a group of monks called the Vajians were soliciting and accepting gold and silver. That means they went out to collect donations with the aim of collecting gold and silver. So Venerable Yasa criticized them to say they should not do this because under the Vinaya rules, monks should not touch gold and silver. They should not be handling gold and silver at all. But the Vajan monks did not want to listen to him. In fact, their response was to try to bribe Venerable Yasa by offering him a share of the money in hope that he would be won over. In any case, Venerable Yasa did not fall for that. He went to report these breaches of the rules to Venerable Revata. So Venerable Revata advised him that a council should be called. So during this council, there were 10 disputed points which were brought up before the most senior monks at the time. So among the 10 points, some of them are to do with food. Like using salt and horns means that the monks should not preserve that food. That means you eat one and then that's it. Not to preserve that food. Eating after midday, I think this is a rule for the Theravada monks. They do not eat after midday. So the Mahayana monks, they do eat after midday. Like. So the Theravada monks, they still stick to these two rules. So again, another food item, they should not eat more than once. In other words, they should not eat and then go and find another place to eat again. Nah, because in, in which case, not only are you uh, creating more greed for yourself, you also impose on the lay people uh, their support. So the other things are just uh, procedural in matter, like holding Bukhosata ceremony, Vinaya ceremony, with, not according to the proper rules. This is about the practice. This is another food item, drinking unfermented palm wine, using a mat that has fringes. So the key one is this accepting and using gold and silver. So this was what was decided that the council passed a verdict against the Vajan monks and declared their conduct unlawful. So a total of 700 monks here in this council reaffirmed the teachings of the Buddha by reciting again the Dharma and Vinaya. So however, those unorthodox Vajan monks refused to accept this verdict and they left to hold a council of their own. This resulted in the Buddhist order splitting into two sects. And this is known as the Great Schism of Buddhism. So the second council led to this split. This split in the Sangha. Before there's only one order of monks, now become two. So those liberal Vajan monks became the Mahasangikas or the Great Community. The Orthodox monks that stick to the rules, the original rules, became known as the Community of Elders. 
So after that, as you can see from this chart, this is how Buddhism spread now from here, India. He went on to Sri Lanka first in the 3rd century BCE. Much later then, it started to go into China in the 1st century CE, and then much, much, much later to Tibet in the 8th century CE. So this is the proliferation of Buddhism after the Buddha's passing away. So as you can see, in India, these are the key, like Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. So India was the first, and then after that, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, Burma, and Thailand. And then Mahayana originated in India, and then started to spread to China after the first century CE, and again, much later to Korea, Japan, and then finally to Tibet. So these are some scenes from the Sali. Some of the Buddha's relics were found in here. You can visit quite a nice place. So the second council was to discuss the ten disputed points and this led to the split between the liberal Mahasangikas and the orthodox Stavarivadans, the Great Schism. So these are the forerunners of the Mahayana. These are not the Mahayana. These are the forerunners of the Mahayana. And the Stavarivadans are not the Theravadans, but they are the forerunners of the Theravadans. It was during the course of time that they developed into the Mahayana and the Theravada. So the importance of the Great Council is this schism between the community of monks. This is how we have this split between Mahayana and Theravada right now. The Third Council, possibly the most important after the First Council, is the Third Council. This took place 200 years after the Buddha's passing held at Asoka Rama in Pataliputta, the patronage of King Asoka, the greatest king of India, acknowledged even by the Indians themselves. So presided over by Venerable Mogaliputta Tisa and 1,000 monks. Okay, somewhere here, Pataliputta. So in between, are always around this area. So a bit of background about King Asoka. He was originally a particularly ambitious and ruthless man. He took the throne by killing all his brothers, some half-brothers, some real brothers, except for one, one of his real brothers. So he went on to conquer the neighboring states and cause a great deal of death and destruction. However, he eventually realized that the suffering was caused to hundreds of thousands of people in his area. I think during one campaign, more than 100,000 people were killed and more than 200,000 people were maimed and wounded. So because of that, he realized that his conquest, his ambition caused so much suffering and he converted to Buddhism by a young novice monk called Nigroda. So thereafter, he ruled according to the Buddhist ideas of pacifism and compassion and his empire flourished greatly. So he became a man of great compassion. He prohibited animal sacrifices. He forbade the killing of animals in the palace for consumption. He forbade all kinds of cruelty in the kingdom. He even had animal hospitals throughout his kingdom for animals that were hurt or injured. So you can see how compassionate he is towards all beings, not only human beings, but to animals also. So King Asoka spread Buddhism throughout India through things called the rock edicts and pillars, which had important teachings inscribed on them. Many of these things can still be found today. These are archaeological treasures, some of which survive. This is an Asokan pillar. The inscriptions, all the engravings are here at the base. Now. So this is a close-up of the pillar, very well maintained. This one of the rock edicts, it means that these flat pieces of boulders, huge rocks, and then they inscribe all the teachings here. So King Asoka used his vast wealth to build stupas, temples, viharas throughout India, and because of his devotion, he provided a great deal of generous support to the monks, to the Sangha. But what happened was that many unwholesome people, greedy people, they joined the Sangha not because they wanted to practice, but because of all this general support. In other words, they, they, they could just join and then because of the support, they could lead very easy lives, just stay in the temple, have good food, relax, and then just enjoy life. So, but these people, because they joined not to practice, not to learn, they held wrong views and preached all kinds of heretical teachings, all kinds of wrong teachings. So they made the Sangha very corrupt. And worse than that, they said they gave all the wrong teachings to the people. So King Asoka wanted to rectify this situation. He asked one of the elder monks at that time, in fact probably the most senior monk at that time, Venerable Mogaliputta Tisa, to help rectify this situation. 
But what happened is that because of the corruption of all these monks, this venerable left the area to live on his own. And then all the other monks, the proper monks, the monks who followed the Vinaya rules, who actually practiced and learned the Dharma, they did not want to, to associate with the other bogus monks, those corrupt monks. So they did not want to hold their ceremonies with them. But King Asoka actually wanted to have these ceremonies to purify the Sangha. So he asked one of his ministers to approach those genuine monks uh, to hold these ceremonies. But the monks refused to hold these ceremonies with the bogus monks. So what happens is that the minister threatened these monks with a sword. So those monks that refused to carry out these instructions, he killed them. So this minister actually killed the monks one by one. Those authentic monks, those real monks. And then he came to the last monk. This last monk was actually King Asuka's brother. Then he realized, what is he doing? He almost killed the king's brother. Then he stopped. Then he went back to King Asuka to ask, what should he do? So therefore, King Asuka went to look for Moggali Putatisa to ask him to help rectify this situation. So eventually, the Venerable selected 1,000 senior monks to again recite and reaffirm the Dharma. This process took nine months to confirm. So before that, the king questioned the monks from many monasteries. So those who held the wrong views, those who were not able to tell him the correct teachings of the Buddha, they were exposed and expelled. I think some were branded so that they cannot come back. So the Sangha was purged of heretics and all the corrupt and bogus monks. So the other impact of the Third Council was that this book called the Katavatu was written. Because at that time, there were a lot of heretical wrong teachings. So this book was compiled by the Venerable Mughaliputta Tisa to refute these heretical teachings, to show what are the right teachings and what are the wrong teachings. But the most significant achievement of this council was the sending of missionary monks to nine different regions around India. King Asoka decided to spread the Dharma in India and beyond. The most successful, the most important mission was the Sri Lanka. If not for this mission, probably Theravada Buddhism would not have survived. Or even if it had survived, it would not be in this form today because of a long chain of sequences involving Sri Lanka, Burma and Thailand when Buddhism went up, down, up, down, up, down and almost disappeared. So this was the most important aspect of the Third Council the mission to spread Buddhism to Sri Lanka. And this mission was led by Venera Mahinda, who was King Asoka's son. So Venera Mahinda eventually converted the Sri Lankan king and all his subjects to Buddhism. And the Tipitaka was brought over in stages and eventually compiled in writing in Sri Lanka, which I showed you just now when it was written down in Alavihara. So without this, we would not have this Theravada Buddhism in this form, if not for all these sequence of events. So this is the place where Venerable Hinda first came in Sri Lanka, Mihintale. This is a great stupa. It's beautiful. I was there last year. So in fact, many of these photos we took ourselves. This is the place where supposedly Venerable Hinda converted the Sri Lankan king. And this is a peak where according to legend, Venerable Hinda landed here in Sri Lanka at the top of this peak and then he gave his teachings from this point. You can see the view. It's steep and uh, beautiful scenery. So first priority go India, second priority go Sri Lanka. When I first went there, I thought nothing much to see. But it's amazing, there's really so many beautiful things to see there. Okay, so just to re recap the importance of these three councils, which is necessary that you can gain a better understanding of Buddhism and its evolution and development. So the first council again, to recite and reaffirm the Dharma and Vinaya to protect and preserve the teachings of the Buddha. The second council is about the ten disputed points which, which eventually led to the split between the liberal Mahasangikas, forerunners of the Mahayana, and the orthodox Stavarivadans, forerunners of the Theravada. And finally, the third council, the purification of the Sangha by King Asoka, and the sending of the missionary monks to nine different regions, the most important by far being Sri Lanka. So I hope this will enable you all to get a better understanding. Because without this background knowledge, you wouldn't know how all this Dharma, Vinaya, what is the significance, and then how we get to this Theravada, Mahayana, and all these teachings which have come through.
Sri Lanka. Yes, three videos completed.